Um, so we thought we will um, uh, consider uh, nuclear power and explore uh, evolution of nuclear power technology towards more advanced applications. Uh, today, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, I will talk about um, why we came to do fission fragments for propulsion in space power applications in this particular context. Um, I will name and list missions uh, requiring novel power applications. Uh, most of the time, I will talk about uh, fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor, uh, architectures that come from uh, this technology, how we advance that um, experimental, mostly computational work, and then, of course, uh, conclusions and uh, acknowledgments of people who work on this concept. So as far as introduction, of course, when we talk about uh, missions requiring long time, especially far from conventional sources for uh, space applications, uh, nuclear technology, nuclear energy come as a natural uh, choice, uh, at least uh, to consider. Uh, of course, uh, that being said, conventional nuclear technology has its own history. It came uh, within about 60 years of operation. It's um, reasonably safe. Uh, it's rather conventional. It uses uh, conventional heat uh, to convert uh, nuclear power to um, electricity, or process heat, or uh, whatever else we desire. Um, when we uh, consider nuclear power, uh, then of course, usually this kind of chart shows up and we talk about uh, producing about 200 uh, MeV uh, per fission event. And in those 200 MeV, we have neutrons, we have fission fragments, we have other radiation types. And out of those particles, fission fragments carry about 90% of energy. Uh, that's why it makes sense to consider, can we utilize um, uh, nuclear power for ion propulsion for um, something that's more efficient than a conventional heat engine. So this is an uh, um, energy conversion chart. And uh, in the conventional system, of course, we let uh, fission fragments to dissipate their kinetic energy. They slow down completely, they produce heat, and then um, we produce uh, thermal energy conversion. Uh, in the more advanced scenarios, we would like to go beyond what has been developed since 1950s and explore situations when we can take um, fission fragments before they have chances to dissipate their kinetic energy uh, into heat and the charged particles, the positively charged ions, uh, utilize the charge uh, directly. Uh, that's rather challenging. It certainly goes uh, against what conventional uh, fission reactor is designed to do because uh, in a conventional reactor, fission fragments are not supposed to escape. They're highly radioactive. They carry uh, certain danger as far as radiotoxicity is concerned. And most of the accidents related to nuclear power, uh, pretty much all of them deal with release of fission fragments uh, into the environment. Uh, history of uh, utilization of charged particles for direct energy conversion is quite long. Uh, it starts actually even before a uh, neutron was discovered and conventional nuclear power started. In 1913, uh, electricity from kinetic energy of charged particles uh, was suggested for um, energy producing devices. Then in 1944, uh, Wigner suggested that uh, fission fragments, uh, following the same principle that they carry most of the uh, fission energy with them, can be utilized directly in appropriately designed devices. And after that, uh, work on the subject started. Uh, jet propulsion laboratory experiments were uh, successful to demonstrate principles, but they haven't been able to demonstrate uh, efficiency in those times. Superconducting magnets were not there. Other enabling technologies were not there. So the research slowed down. And every 10 years or so, um, enabling technology appears and there's a little bit more advancement as far as uh, converting fission energy directly to um, utilizable form. 
Uh, starting with 1999, um, we began our efforts focusing on a uh, fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor at Texas A&M University. And uh, our lead uh, at Sandia National Laboratory was focusing on fission fragment uh, electric cell. Uh, I will show you the difference um, in a few seconds. And we have been doing this um, uh, with funding fluctuations uh, ever since. Uh, in um, a fission electric cell uh, situation, uh, we have um, ability to convert um, charged particles, fission fragments, directly to um, electricity directly in the reactor core. Uh, that's rather challenging because none of the electric components capable to survive uh, radiation environment uh, easily, and we like to utilize superconducting magnets. None of them really work uh, in the radiation environment for a uh, sufficiently long time. But at the same time, if we consider small devices, if we consider small sources driven by uh, charged particles, that's certainly a viable concept considering the efficiency. Uh, the second approach uh, would allow um, a little bit more reliable operation because we are not claiming that we convert energy inside the reactor core. Um, our major challenge is to let uh, fission fragments out of the reactor core. And then we would harvest them outside reactor core or use them uh, for propulsion. Uh, as a result, in our program, uh, we consider fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor, and I will talk about that concept most of the time, and Sandia National Laboratory, our collaborator, they consider a fission electric cell as a, either in a reactor configuration form or as a small uh, miniature uh, energy device. Uh, in fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor concept, we want to come up with a technologically visible design, something that we can build within the next um, 30 years, 40 years, something like that. Uh, looking for uh, enabling technologies that already have uh, their roots right now. We, don't, we didn't want to invent something that requires technological breakthrough, engineering uh, breakthrough, things like that. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, this is uh, non-conventional application for uh, fission power, and this kind of question certainly makes sense to ask. Uh, we started again as a conventional uh, nuclear reactor for conventional terrestrial applications. Uh, scientific visibility, and that's certainly proven uh, many, many times. So even within our 10 years program, uh, we did experiments to show that, yeah, you can do that. Uh, engineering visibility, can you put together a technologically viable uh, device, design of a reactor, that would be able to operate in this particular way? And then does it make sense uh, economically? Uh, for um, terrestrial applications, probably uh, not so much. The system is probably too advanced, and conventional nuclear reactor uh, is probably significantly simple and more competitive. But as I will try to show you uh, uh, later, certainly for space applications, it does uh, provide uh, attractive features. So, uh, mission for um, propulsion systems that utilize fission fragments. Uh, certainly, anything uh, related to uh, situations when you're um, looking for um, autonomous power source that can operate for a long period of time. If this is a reactor, then it's a controllable source. It's uh, more in your control than, for example, source driven by uh, radioisotope driven sources and things like that. Missions beyond when uh, you would have uh, challenges converting solar power uh, with sufficient efficiency and things like that. And of course, uh, interstellar missions, interstellar probes, um, when you would need to have reliable supply for a very long time. Um, there is a challenge, of course, we want um, interstellar probe and this kind of interstellar probe probably can be launched today. Uh, the only challenge with that probe would be it just takes too long time uh, to reach um, nearest uh, star system. And we wouldn't have um, anything uh, coming from that probe anytime soon when we would have uh, interest in that. For example, Voyager spacecraft is flying well beyond uh, original time, uh, very successful, but 
uh, current generations probably don't really know what that is. Uh, the same thing would be applicable for interstellar propulsion. We can send something that would uh, fly for millennia, but uh, human history doesn't really carry memory for that long. So we wanted to uh, explore uh, if highly energetic fission fragments can work better and provide something within human lifetime. So fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor. Uh, the idea of the concept is very simple. It hasn't changed since 1950s. Uh, the idea is to generate um, charged particles within the reactor core, uh, design that uh, reactor core in such a way that you can allow fission fragments to escape, which makes it very, very non-conventional, um, almost non-suitable for terrestrial applications because of the radioactivity carried with uh, fission fragments, uh, and the then thing uh, guide for fission fragments out of we the reactor core. That would, they uh, positively charge ions, but certainly uh, they can be reliably guided by uh, magnetic field. And then if you can separate uh, fission fragments from electrons, and there are about 500 electrons coming with each fission fragment uh, in a fission event, then um, you will have a um, fairly unique uh, ion source. There are advancements in fusion technology uh, focused on uh, guiding uh, charged particles, ca charged particle streams, uh, separating positively charged particles and uh, electrons, and certainly this concept takes advantage of that. We also take advantage of uh, so-called Venetian blind uh, collectors that were originally developed for uh, fusion technology uh, in the 60s. Uh, so, for fission fragments to escape, uh, you have to provide a very, very small thin layer of fuel, uh, which implies that either fuel is very specialized and efficient to maintain a reactor operation, or it has to be very large reactor to make up for uh, thin fuel elements. Uh, the thinner fuel element is the better for the concept because in the limit you would allow both fission fragments to escape. Uh, we looked at several configurations, several design options for fuel element, and we discovered that uh, um, various forms of uh, graphite nanotubes uh, would probably work, bad, uh, would work best uh, in this configuration because uh, thicknesses of those materials, arrangements of those materials, density would allow a uh, significant fraction of fission fragments to leave uh, reactor core, and that's our design goal for fuel element. Uh, we looked at various arrangements of fuel elements, and that's certainly a uh, work in progress. It heavily depends on how we can manufacture uh, fuel element and uh, fuel assemblies for the reactor. Uh, but there are certainly viable options that would allow us to provide uh, nearly 80% uh, uh, escape fractions uh, from the reactor core. Uh, building uh, from that, uh, we put together a configuration that provides us ability to uh, manage fission fragments within the reactor core, operate nuclear reactor as a conventional nuclear reactor at the same time, and then uh, collect um, fission fragments and produce electricity or use their kinetic energy for uh, propulsion. Uh, in um, nuclear fuels, uh, up to as high as 90% of energy is carried by fission fragments. And this is your ultimate limit, how much energy you can harvest, compared to 30-40% in a heat engine that conventionally uh, produces uh, electricity today. Uh, certainly, 90% is probably not possible, but if you get 60-70%, it's still pretty good. Uh, we designed various magnetic field configurations that would allow us to uh, manage fission fragments, separate them from electrons, and I'll guide them uh, out of the reactor core to the locations that we desire. This is just one of the examples how this can be done. Um, certainly, uh, um, collimator in its name, uh, again, uh, borrows from fusion technology. Collimators uh, is another component borrowed from uh, fusion energy converters. Uh, and, of course, for uh, viable designs, you have to have fuel. 
Uh, we considered conventional fuels based on uranium, we considered plutonium, and then we arrived at fuels based on uh, more advanced uh, actinide configurations. Uh, americium, americium 242 metastable, uh, appears to be, um, if you want, a reactor similar to conventional nuclear reactors, about three meters uh, core, then uh, mm -hmm. you're talking about uh, high actinides. Uh, this chart uh, shows you need about one metric ton to maintain operation if you're using mm -hmm. uranium, and only 15 kilograms if you're using americium-242 metastable. Um, various configurations become possible. You can develop highly transparent arrangement, uh, taking advantage of so uh, low mass you need for operating this type of system. And of course, uh, energy chart. Uh, because of the low core density uh, for uh, reasonably small power levels within the system, we don't really need to provide uh, coolant. Uh, radiative heat transfer appears to be sufficient. And all in all, we can uh, asymptotically get about 65-70% uh, uh, energy conversion efficiency if we're targeting uh, electricity generation. Uh, this is how a fission fragment magnetic collimator reactor would look like. Uh, in this particular configuration, um, this is uh, targeting uh, electricity generation. Uh, we're using six-stage Venetian blind uh, type collectors to harvest fission fragments and compute and generate electricity. Uh, the design just to harvest fission fragments allow separation reliably from electrons to uh, um, fission fragments. Uh, it's about 60 meters from side to side. Again, it's a theoretical design. It's probably a real system will not look quite like that, but uh, at least this carries the features uh, that we needed from uh, the design. So um, summarizing what we're trying to accomplish, we certainly uh, explored uh, ultra-thin fuel layers and uh, ability to produce fission fragments from those fission layers. Um, we explored the ability to suppress uh, secondary electrons. And interesting enough, uh, in fission electric cell concept, uh, managing electrons gives you an uh, additional source of energy, whereas in case of fission fragment, you probably ignore them, but in case of fission electric cell, you can take advantage of both uh, fission fragments and electrons. Um, we explored uh, conventional reactor physics um, aspect of the concept to make sure that it can operate for sufficiently long time. Uh, stability of um, superconducting magnets and other energy conversion components and the radiation, and development of uh, superconducting magnets and insulators to perform under radiation. That's certainly um, something that would be considered enabling technology for this that we would need to explore uh, more. Um, possible architectures based on this um, reference design. Um, uh, for space power and propulsion is our next uh, logical application because, again, for terrestrial um, aspect, it's probably not quite suitable, but uh, it provides high, efficiently direct, uh, high efficiency direct energy conversion. Uh, it has quite high, high specific impulse considering fission fragment energy. Uh, it certainly can operate for a very long time, depending on the power. Um, but uh, certainly in excess of uh, several decades, maybe 100 years. Um, there is no chemical propellant. It can be ion propulsion only. Uh, we're talking about uh, absence of conventional uh, thermal conversion in a conventional sense, uh, absence of moving parts. Uh, if there is no um, coolant, if there is no uh, conventional um, heat removal systems, then there are literally no moving parts. So if we talk about ion propulsion uh, and using fission fragments for that purpose, then certainly we're talking about removing uh, Venetian blind type collectors and using this as a, a magnetic nozzle. Uh, we can uh, develop an architecture for um, interstellar probe that would allow us to consider um, arming this probe with a reactor like that. Uh, all in all, summarizing um, what theoretical calculations show, um, 
fission fragments would allow approaching about 10% of speed of light. And um, if this theoretical uh, speed is achievable, then um, the probe would uh, allow you to uh, approach a uh, nearest star system in about uh, 43 years. Again, theoretical calculations, but certainly it looks uh, quite promising and it achieves uh, our initial goal that we wanted to uh, design a technologically feasible design, technologically feasible configuration that can uh, have chance to approach nearest star system within a human lifetime. So that's what this design approach. So as far as technology roadmap, uh, we wanted to combine uh, theoretical developments, uh, reactors, and any design works really great on the paper. Uh, we wanted to um, provide uh, some experimental support for that. So uh, you will see what uh, we have done to produce a magnetic collimator reactor. Yeah, it's, it's this right here. It's, a, it's interacting it's with the microphone. Okay. So, um, and um, considering roadmap, uh, well, starting with 1957, uh, Safon of design of the reactor, quite advanced, and we think that uh, configuration that we have right now is technologically feasible. Uh, as I mentioned before, we don't really uh, require uh, technological breakthrough, substantial scientific advancements. But at the same time, certainly some enabling technologies would be needed, and some of them is being developed in parallel for a variety of other applications. We talked about uh, actinide fuels. We talked about combinations of fuels and um, graphite. Uh, we talked about ultra-thin films with actinide fuels. Those technologies exist. Uh, we talk about superconducting solenoids. We talk about uh, using ion propulsion, a Vazimir engine uh, performed successfully. Um, we have uh, borrowed Venetian blind collectors and um, uh, collimators from fusion technology, and those designs were proven um, about 40 years ago. So for experimental demonstration, considering funding available to us, uh, we decided that um, we're probably not going to have uh, a meridium in our reactor core, and we might not necessarily be able to afford to have reactor core. But uh, we're talking about ions, and as a result, uh, using accelerator of cyclotron, in our case, certainly provides a surrogate representation of what reactor core uh, may look like. So we uh, replaced reactor core with uh, accelerator beam line, um, theoretically uh, providing ions that we desire if we want uh, as closely as possible replicating fission fragments. And then uh, we have uh, conventional superconducting magnets um, assembling um, solenoids uh, around the reactor core and assembling uh, and shaping magnetic field around um, the area that would be a uh, collimator design. Uh, so um, we conducted these experiments, we uh, certainly on a much smaller scale, but uh, it allowed us to achieve within these configurations, not extraction from the reactor core, but guidance and collection of fission fragments on the order of 85-95%. Uh, with magnetic fields of about uh, two Tesla. Uh, because it's a scaled system, uh, of course, it translates uh, to uh, much lower overall efficiencies if you uh, scale it up to uh, what would be uh, actual uh, magnetic collimator reactor. So in conclusion, uh, summarizing, uh, we're talking about a novel application of uh, nuclear power. We're taking advantage of uh, technology developed in the last uh, 60 years for uh, terrestrial applications. It's not really a conventional nuclear reactor because we're violating uh, basic principles in allowing fission fragments to escape from the reactor core. Conventionally, uh, we do exactly opposite in terrestrial reactors. Uh, it's not a fusion system, but we're borrowing components from uh, fusion configurations, and those have been already um, devised, tested, and uh, there are work, uh, working uh, engineering solutions. Uh, we're looking at uh, a new physics approach as far as um, 
trying to put together a reactor core based on uh, um, ultra small uh, fuel elements coated with uh, high actinide fuels. Uh, overall, uh, the design, at least at conceptual level, we believe gives us a good start. And experimental studies allows us to validate um, magnetic components and get as close as we can uh, to validation of the overall performance. Of course, um, permitting a surrogate representation of the reactor core with uh, accelerator instead. Uh, it's very low fuel inventory core. And of course, you can move to um, conventional fuels. Americium is extremely rare material. There is about 4,000 metric tons available today if you estimate that number of everything that has been uh, made available from the beginning of nuclear era. Um, it's certainly a high efficiency system. It goes in limits to uh, 75, 80%, 90% is theoretical limit. Uh, there are no moving components. Radiative heat transfer take care of uh, heat removal uh, in this case. You can take advantage of uh, heat uh, produced within core for additional energy conversion if desired. Uh, there is certainly a um, uh, possibility to integrate multiple units uh, of this configuration to produce a larger power output. So, uh, and uh, at the end, I like to uh, acknowledge uh, our funding sources. Uh, we had um, started this program, as I said, 10 years ago with a federal funding source. Uh, and then we moved to um, a number of funding sources, the largest of them it would be Sandia National Laboratory and Lockheed Martin. A uh, few of my collaborators and contributors to be mentioned, it continuously evolving, but uh, we started with Ted Parrish and Ron Hart uh, in 99, and we continue for uh, about 10 years uh, with a team of uh, students and postdoctoral researchers. With that in mind, uh, I finished my uh, 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 introduction to you of this technology, and I'd like to open for questions. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, are there any questions? Can you raise, oh gosh, there are lots of questions. This is a good thing. Um, uh, so, so the gentleman um, who's just stood up there, could, could you ask your question? Okay. My name is Winterberg. I published in 1957, at that time called Astronautica Acta paper, where I suggested direct conversion of Christian. Yeah. Okay. Your history, you may have overlooked my paper, which I published in Astronautica Acta in 1957. They suggested to use sufficient products to charge up a capacitor to very high voltages. And of course, you can have a copy of it in other ways. In other words, if you have, if you have fission, fission material, then you can think of making a capacitor feedback where sufficient products go from one thin uh, plate from uranium to 35 to the other, and then of course you get an electrostatic potential, which could be theoretically a couple of hundred million volts, corresponding to the uh, kinetic energy of sufficient products. And the problem is how to prevent a breakdown of these different ways. So, and I, I can give you my paper here. Oh, I would you appreciate that. Yeah. I'm sorry? I would appreciate that, yes. Okay. Six propulsion systems, uh, AEC's system nuclear, space nuclear systems program, and uh, at that time it was terminated by the Carter administration. They really didn't want fission fragments out in space. But uh, in your case, how does your uh, concept compare with nuclear thermal propulsion, solid core, uh, cooled by hydrogen gas? assisted by um, uh, electric propulsion, converting heat from that core 
to ion, xenon ion thrusters. Um, well, um, we didn't really make that comparison. We didn't really, we were focusing on this concept. So I don't really have numerical numbers to make them uh, side by side. We, um, again, we never did comparison, but we were thinking that because we don't require uh, carrying additional uh, materials and we can go with the nuclear reactor, probably it would have advantages. Numerically, can you make um, those systems as efficient as this? Are there engineering penalties in both cases? Um, one of the major reasons we didn't compare is because this is not as mature as the technology. engineering standpoint may, for example, this too difficult to do from this point. And we just uh, don't have enough details to provide for uh, justifiable compa comparison, for fair comparison. Uh, but it's a question that we ask every yeah. question. So my question is much more simple. What do you want to do with the neutrons? And is there something useful you can do with them, not just to get the energy, but so you don't have spallation effects and damage your materials? Is this a resource or is this a problem? Do you look uh, at that? Neutron, we take it, we take it. Uh, neutrons, uh, we use them uh, in a conventional sense in a nuclear reactor because we need neutrons to sustain a uh, fission chain reaction. So we don't really uh, ignore them. We need them. And uh, as far as um, neutrons are concerned, it's a conventional system. And, uh, yes? are the uh, fission fragments uh, using Ameri americium, for example? I mean, what, what, what are they? Um, isotopes of iron, uh, um, light elements, uh, those would be fission fragments. Iron would be an example of those. Yeah, do, do you have a metric for the number of newtons per kilogram in the uh, Magnus model? And Newtons per watt. Uh, yes, I do have number. I don't have a slide on that, uh, but I do have a number. I, I can offline give you a number. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Yes. So, what is the lower limit of mass for a uh, for a system like this? And then, sort of similar to the to the other question, how does the uh, eventual uh, delta V compared to the mass of the of the reactor itself scale in terms of, you know, how 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 does the size of the core itself relate to how fast it can get you? Uh, we didn't get to that level of details because uh, it's not just a core. There's a lot of uh, components that allow you to extract fission fragments out of the core, and we didn't get to that level of details. We didn't. We cannot produce that number yet. Are there any more questions? Yes. There are, no, there are no moving parts in theory in theoretical design. Um, it depends what you would consider reliable and what can go wrong uh, with the system. But uh, if, you can, if it's low enough power that it doesn't require coolant to move through the reactor core, then it's sufficiently passive. And you would assume that uh, at least at theoretical level, uh, it would be reliable. I've got one just from a practicality. 
graphic standpoint, what are the components that you need to improve or redesign in order to make this a more efficient and more useful, well, I don't want to say useful, but um, more tangible? Uh, yeah. The next uh, step would be to uh, finalize design of the fuel and uh, to answer most of the practical questions of system weight, how it compares, and things like that. Uh, we did only preliminary um, investigations of that. It's expensive to uh, answer those questions. And superconducting magnets. And configurations that would be um, um, radiation tolerant. I'm talking about magnets around uh, the reactor core. So do you have a parts, I guess, do you have a parts list then for what you still need? I know, I know it's a very detailed question, but do you have a parts list for the items that you need to improve still? Of course. There are enabling technologies that uh, uh, would require uh, engineering advancements, yes. Uh, yes, we did experiments with the accelerator providing ion source and collector uh, without magnetic field. And uh, certainly that provides nearly 100% uh, uh, collection for uh, ions. It can be very, very efficient. Okay. Uh, jet Propulsion Laboratory did that uh, in 60s, and that didn't work well. Uh, probably, probably, yes. But, uh, Was that a final question? Thank you. Uh, what, uh, I didn't catch what kind of temperatures are throughout the system uh, would, would it be operating at uh, different areas? What, what would be the maximum temperature and how widespread would that be? And what kind of fuel consumption would this be using? Um, we, uh, we designed the reactor core uh, that I showed you, f assuming that it can withstand uh, 1,000 Kelvin uh, as a maximum temperature in the reactor core. That's the choices for ceramics and graphite. Uh, for how long, depends on the reactor power. And if power is reasonably low, it can operate for a very long time. Uh, we were assuming that for reference designs, um, we put together configurations that can last uh, at least 10 years uh, at s uh, smaller power levels. But that depends on power consumption and how quickly uh, you want to burn it. I'm sure we'd all like to th uh, thank Dr. Sveko for his uh, fascinating talk. Um, and the next speaker now is Dr. John Hunter on the hydrogen gas gun, which is part of the interstellar roadmap. So if we could, ha is Dr. Hunter here? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> hey, if you have a mobile phone on you, <laughs> do you want to leave it at the front desk? <laughs> guys it does work okay yeah I'm John Hunter uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the work that was done back in the 90s on project super harp and then I'm going to discuss a follow-on to that project that relevant to you guys so uh, I used to be a particle physicist for about a nanosecond back in the 80s and then I was picked up by Livermore and I was uh, I was hired to build giant electric guns but in the process I got side uh, sidetracked at a cocktail party and someone mentioned gas guns to me, and so I ended up uh, building gas guns instead. John, so, you accidentally uh, hit the wrong button. Okay, so here. <laughs> there we go. How's that? Okay, so here's, here's the fundamental issue to me. We all want to get to the stars at some point, but the first thing is you do want to be able to explore the moon and to Mars. And so what I did was I did a quick, uh, a quick look at the, the metrics for the moon and Mars, and we have data on going to the moon, and it's about 100,000 pounds per propellant per person to go to the moon. And the, the projected data for Mars, this is based on two studies, one by Von Braun, one by Boeing with a, a, a nuclear rocket, was about a million pounds of propellant to go to Mars per person. This is starting from LEO and coming back to LEO. So 
you can see pretty quickly that if you, uh, if you have the current cost, which is 5000 per pound, it breaks the bank. So if you try and do a, like a Lewis and Clark expedition where you have, say, 30 people going to the moon, 30 people going to Mars, et cetera, the first case is going to be $16 billion. second case is going to be $160 billion. So obviously, $16 billion is the quanta that we assign to NASA usually per year. And probably 80% of that is legacy projects. So we're never going to get there. So the fundamental issue is how do you reduce those costs? And so here's how hydrogen gas guns work, in case you guys are curious about guns. The, uh, the maximum speed of a gun is a very simple equation. It's a one-line equation, which is that the max velocity is the sound speed divided by the specific heat ratio minus one. And so if you look at that for a, a couple of different gases, for example, uh, gunpowder, helium, and hydrogen, you can see where gunpowder maxes are out around, say, three kilometers per second at a couple thousand Kelvin. And uh, helium is a little bit better than that. And then because uh, hydrogen's got a very low molecular weight, it's about uh, 8,000, 8, 9,000 meters per second, which turns out to be, coincidentally, uh, the numbers you need to get into low Earth orbit. You need about nine kilometers to get to low Earth orbit. Now, this is, this is hard data that exists right now. There's a gas gun at the AEDC facility in Tennessee that gets uh, as high as seven kilometers per second with, gram, with 100 gram uh, size objects, and it gets to about four kilometers per second with, say, eight kilos. Now, if this system was turned vertically and shot into space, you would get four or 500 kilometers into space. It would come back down. It would set the world record for altitude in the process. Now, here's what we propose. Uh, I'm no longer at Livermore, but this is sort of uh, freelance stuff. Uh, and the idea is you want to launch propellant because it's a fundamental uh, metric, it's a fundamental uh, quanta or, or, or uh, medium. You need to explore the, uh, the solar system. And so we would want to launch a vehicle at, say, six kilometers per second. You supply a delta V of about three kilometers per second with the rocket. Uh, the sequence is you capture the hydrogen after the, this vehicle comes out the muzzle. The so suppose separates and lands nearby. Of course, it's, it, it burns up in the process. Uh, the vehicle ascends at 30 degrees. There's, there's a bit of ablation going on in the forebody and the nose. There's a sonic boom for about a millisecond downrange. It's, it's always perpendicular to trajectory. Uh, you discard the aeroshell at 100 clicks, and then you burn a rocket for 100 seconds. You may have a one or two stage rocket to circularize, depending on how aggressive you are with the rocket. And finally, you dock with the, an orbiting gas station and, and you dispense the propellant. So that's the plan. Now, this is a couple of little, uh, little uh, uh, curves here showing you different options you've got. But of course, the, the sexiest option is probably a two-stage liquid, which gets you, on the, on the vertical axis, gets you about 28% propellant uh, fraction. So you launch this vehicle out, and roughly 28% uh, of that vehicle is payload. Now, if you look at the classic things like Falcon 1 or Falcon 9, they're around 3 to 4% propellant fraction. So, so the reason this wins in the long run is because you amortize the gun. You shoot the gun many, many, many times. So the gun cost per shot goes like 1 over N. So as N goes to 10 to the 4th, the gun comes down to almost 0 in terms of the cost. And then by virtue of having roughly a 30% payload fraction as opposed to a 3%, you get a 10 to 1 advantage there over ordinary rockets. So here, here, these are the three semi-easy pieces. And the first one is build a large hydrogen gas gun. So it's sort of funny, because I was a theoretical physicist very, very briefly, but then I went and started building things because it was much more fulfilling to have hardware than it was to promote view graphs, which I used to do, and, and do quantum mechanical calculations. And so I built the system. The third gun I built was 400 feet long. And when I say I built it, the crew built it. I had the world's best engineers working for me. I had Fred Reinecker, who passed away just before the first shot. And I had Lou Bertolini and a whole bunch of other guys who were really talented engineers. So that was done. That system exists. Uh, it's actually in a, in a warehouse in San Diego right now, the gun is, because it served its purpose for the Air Force and for, Na and for other folks. Uh, the second topic you've got to do is you've got to G-harden the electronics. Now, we did this for NASA in, in, for DARPA in 1998. So that part has already been done. It's been proven. You can G-harden electronics to, to tens of thousands, even 100,000 Gs. And then finally, you've got to G-harden a rocket because you need a rocket for orbital insertion. That was done back in the late 90s as well, and uh, we have rounds in the inventory now that are rocket-assisted rounds that go down range quite a ways. This is the first item. This is a little gizmo. It's basically a satellite we built. I think the whole contract was under $50,000 with DARPA. 
It had uh, photovoltaics on it. It had store and forward. It had TV cameras. It had uh, uh, ordinary power supplies out of Radio Shack parts. It had switches, etc. And it was G hardened to 3,200 Gs. We took it to a test range in Florida, shot it out of a gun, recovered it. And it worked perfectly after we recovered it. This is the second part of the equation, which is this gun-launched rocket. This was built by CAES in, I think it's in Maryland, and uh, they were launching this out of a 155 millimeter, uh, millimeter uh, howitzer, solid. And this is the business end of Sharp. Now, Sharp was sort of a funny-looking gun. It was 400 feet long, but only about 160 feet of it was the business end, which was the, the, the skinny tube. It was a 4-inch diameter tube. The other 200 and some, 260 feet or so was, was uh, large, 14-inch, uh, it looked like a giant pipeline, a uh, petroleum pipeline. So you can see on the right, you can see that 14-inch diameter, 20-inch OD, uh, that extends about 200 and some feet to the right. And then uh, coming up, up the grade a little bit here towards us is the business end. We pull a vacuum on that. There's a mylar diaphragm on the end there. And uh, the way this operates is we fill it with hydrogen. Most of the, the big tubes fill with hydrogen. At the very far end, I had it look like a giant beer keg. It was about a one metric ton beer keg with some plastic on the nose. And we would shoot this beer keg down into the hydrogen at extremely high speed. It would go into the hydrogen at about 300 meters per second, compress the hydrogen, and eventually the hydrogen would get to 6,000 psi, and it would rupture a, uh, a tensile specimen. And it would drive what in those days was a scramjet, supersonic combustion ramjet, up the launch tube at very high speed. So we're getting to Mach 9 for the, one of the customers, uh, which was the Air Force in that case. And then so the scramjet comes down this looks like oil well pipe here, and it breaks through that mylar diaphragm. In, in fact, a little shockwave precludes the, uh, the vehicle, so the shockwave blows the mylar out, and so the, the vehicle doesn't get touched by the plastic, and it goes downrange into the target area, and they take photographs, high-speed photos. A little back right here, this is the civil construction in 92. We're building this big old thing. Uh, this is the guys in, in Pennsylvania that are shrink-fitting. We had an exotic part where the where the uh, flow turns the corner at right angles, we had a lot of stress risers, and so we had to do. We had to use the world's most exotic steel for the liner. It's called AF-1410. It's made. They use it for the arresting hooks on aircraft, jet aircraft that land on uh, carriers. So we used the world's biggest forging of that for the interior, and then we shrink fitted three pieces of really high grade steel on top of that, so we get a compressive uh, stress, residual stress, and then uh, uh, you had a really like an eighty thousand pound item of super duper stuff here. Looks like it. These are a couple of the guys uh, getting ready for a shot. And so we had to load the gun from several ends. This is a giant zip gun, so it was not automated. We had guys with uh, moving chains around and pulleys, things like that. We did have a couple of winches. That was about the extent of our, our assistance. That's the first vehicle. That was a scramjet. And this is sort of interesting, but it's a, a sort of a uh, backwater right now. But basically, what happens is you fire this thing through there. This, this screws on. You fill it with hydrogen at 6,000, 7,000 psi, so it's, it's an air breather. And then when this flies through the air, see that little copper nose tip? That, that goes through the air at high speeds and processes the flow. So the flow gets shocked up. It, get, it gets highly shocked off that nose. It enters the cowl, it, it high comp highly compressed and highly, highly uh, hot. And then it mixes with the hydrogen and burns like a regular ramjet, but it burns above Mach 5. That's a shot from 800 feet. Now, I had, I had a really great CNN video with Soledad O'Brien before she became real famous. She came in and interviewed us for a long time. But uh, the video wouldn't show on your, on your gizmo here, so we're going to punt there. This is it going down range in the target area. And uh, Okay, so now... Now, you've seen that that was old history. That happened in, until like 1996 or 98. Uh, now, what I propose is we take that sharp system, we upgrade it. And to, in fact, the original intent was to do shots in space. And so I would like to take this, the 14 inch part of that tube, which was the really vanilla portion of that gun, and point it up uh, at about an 85 degree launch angle out of the Yuma Proving Grounds. Now, Yuma is only about 100 miles from, from San Diego. And they have the world record for altitude in Yuma. They actually shot a gun in, in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, the Y-28 shot got 180 kilometers into, into low space and came back down. That was done by a guy named Gerald Bull, who was working for Saddam back in 91 before he got assassinated by the Mossad. You may have read about that. Or maybe it was before your time. I was the guy that <laughs> I was the other guy that they didn't get, basically. So, uh, but, but all the authors called me up and asked me if I wanted to, to be interviewed, and I, I declined on the interviews in those days. <laughs> So, in fact, I went into toys thereafter because in the toy world, people don't usually shoot you for your mistakes. 
So uh, anyway, so Robital, I want to launch 65, 65 pounds into three, at three clicks, uh, launch it roughly straight up. And so these could be uh, little CubeSats, which a lot of folks like Professor Twiggs in Kentucky would like to deliver to, uh, to low space and come back down. They do scientific experiments. So that's, that would be the first phase. That's suborbital. That could be done for under half a million bucks. No big deal. The second phase is the orbital. And the same system could be used to launch one pound. It would be a two-stage rocket. You'd, you'd launch it at three to four kilometers per second. And then the two-stage would circularize the orbit. And so you'd get a pound roughly into low Earth orbit. That's just sort of like a little stepping stone. It shows what you can do it. Again, it could be made out of sharp components. So this is roughly what it would look like. That's just the 14-inch tube. It's configured uh, in a, in, in our, actually, it would be near vertical. And it looks sort of like that. Basically, it's a Sabode round with fins on it. Nothing really exotic. It's only three kilometers per second. So that doesn't have to be made out of anything unusual, basically. It's a little copper and some aluminum. These are some photos or some uh, JPEGs I pulled out of some previous work. Uh, very vanilla stuff. You'd have you know some very minor diagnostics. If you put a CubeSat in here, you, you change a few of the things there. Looks like this when it comes out the barrel because your Sabo pedals go into four different directions. They fly off the thing and then it, it progresses through the air. And a little simulation of how far it would go. In this case, uh, it would go 350 kilometers altitude, which of course breaks the world record for height. And it comes out at three kilometers per second. You can see it burns a little bit of, the, of its speed off in low atmosphere. And then it does a gravity turn for the next few minutes. And then, of course, it re-enters. I guess when it impacts, it's still going about two kilometers per second. So it'll make a nice hole in the ground when it impacts. And since it's 85 degrees, I think it only goes downrange 100 kilometers downrange. And the COFA test range, which I was on a year or two ago, uh, is actually adequate for this. I think it's got a 70 or 80 click downrange. Uh, that's where he did those early shots for heart. So here's the basic uh, numbers for the economics, because Richard obviously uh, tasked me to look at making this cheap. And uh, I was a little hesitant at first, because I tend to be very practical and, and, and sort of, uh, tr I try to be uh, conservative on things. But I was surprised, because they actually came down fairly close to what he wanted. It just shows motivation, or else I'm not as smart as I used to be, Richard. I don't know. So. Uh, so the basically, the, here's the numbers. The launcher plus the station cost about a million dollars per payload pound. And take my word for that. Those are actually conservative numbers. I could, I could be high by a factor of two. The inert mass I penciled out at $100 per pound. Now, aerospace guys will tell you that we built Boeings for $700 a pound. This is not a manned system. So we're just, these are basically very simple aero shells with some provisions for rocket motors. Uh, the vehicle propellant, that's be, it's locks and RP-1, which is inexpensive. Uh, the O&M, every shot I'm going to take is I'm going to uh, charge 30% to O&M because you have to uh, heat this hydrogen up somehow. And there's different ways to heat it up. I'm not going to use a giant piston. We just use natural gas and, and have a uh, heat exchanger and, flow and counter flow the gases through it. Uh, I'm assuming 8% finances are over 25 years. So you have to, this is the real world. You do have to pay the bank once in a while. Uh, and now here's where it gets aggressive. Basically, we're going to use this a lot. The idea is it's a serious project, so you're not going to do one shot every decade. It's going to do one shot every hour for basically 24 hours a day for 300 days a year. So you're going to have some downtime when you're doing O&M on the gun and stuff. But basically, you're shooting very aggressively. You're shooting 7,000 launches per year. And that's the one over N that drives your cost down. Okay, So basically, as soon as you get to a few thousand launches, you, you paid for the gun. The gun is now in the noise as far as the cost goes. And so your asymptotic costs are just going to be vehicle costs. Now, when you do those numbers, I'll show you the next curve. But basically, you get $110 per pound. I got close. Uh, it was actually 109. So I got close to your number, uh, Richard. Yeah, this is what I come to. So 200, this is a 100-pound, uh, I'm sorry, 200-pound payload, OK? 200-pound payload, $200 million installed cost. That includes both the, the launcher and then, of course, you do have a couple of orbiting gas tanks in space you have to rendezvous with. Uh, six kilometers per second launch. 28% uh, payload fraction, and then the numbers you saw, that's all you need. And there's an inert fraction. I, I, I picked 20% inert fraction, which is a number rocket guys use. It's pretty conservative, because this is a G-hard system. You have to make, uh, have to provide some structural integrity. So you can see very early on, you amortize the gun literally within maybe 10% of your shots. If you're, even if you're doing 700 shots per year, you've amortized a large part of the gun. And at that point, 
it starts to become a flat curve, and that's when you win. You get down to below $200 per pound, literally, you know, a few hundred shots per year, uh, six, seven hundred shots per year, and then it asymptotes out to $100 and $110 per pound. Now, that's probably the last view graph here. Oh, I want to thank my team. These are the guys who made it happen. I was really lucky because I was a young uh, scientist, and uh, if I hadn't had these fantastic engineers working for me, it would have been all theory. And that's where you have to, you have to make things happen, guys. You've got to get engineers, guys, who will build things for you to work on projects because otherwise we're all theorists. You know, we can all em envision things, including Freeman Dyson. He, even he admits that he's, he basically uh, doesn't write science fiction because it's too, too tough, but basically he does a lot, you know, a lot of theoretical wandering. But I would have been a theoretical wanderer also if I, if I hadn't ran into these guys that helped me at Livermore. And I made the presentations and helped bring the money in and built things and blew them up. But basically, Fred Reinecker was my main engineer. And Fred had had 10 different careers at Livermore. He'd always been successful. And ironically, the last career he had was with me. And he died just before we got our first shot off. He died of uh, cancer. And then I had a fantastic engineer, Bert Bertolini, Massey, Snell, Hargis, Haney, Heston, McDonald, uh, Jackson. There was other people in the Sharp team. Then I had Don Hughes, Lowell Wood, Edward Teller. You probably knew who Teller was. He was the guy that invented the H-bomb. Uh, the IRAD committee at Livermore. L Division, the folks at Site 300, that's where the testing was done, and of course, Jules Verne. So that's, that was the team, guys. I think there are many of us who have lot to thank to, um, uh, Jules Verne for. Um, are there any questions? We've got about five minutes for questions. I see there are quite a few hands going up. So there's a gentleman at the front here who shot his hand up, and then there's one over there. Yeah. Uh, during those days, 80s, early 90s, you guys were doing electromagnetic launchers. No, we never did. I was hired to do electromagnetic launchers, uh, and I have a background in magnetics besides other things. But it turned out the, hyd the hydrogen gas gun is so much more efficient that we trumped all the electromagnetic launchers. In fact, if you look at the world records for kinetic energy and for velocity, they're held by gas guns. The real guns, the real guns had a huge amount of political clout, and they had a bunch of guys with master's degrees in, in double E that were pushing them during the SDIO era. But we took all the we took all the records. Well, your near-term application then is because we had assumed uh, electromagnetic launches were down to a hundred dollars a kilogram. Oh, okay. it, that was what they projected, but nothing yeah. remotely came close right. to that. The, yeah. the guys that need you desperately are space-based solar power. That's their limiting. Well, those guys may need uh, analysts more than they need me. <laughs> <laughs> God bless them. I worked on, by the way, I worked on solar power for Boeing uh, also, so that's another topic we could discuss uh, for a beer. There was, there was a question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Any of you guys? I think the guy right there, yeah. What's your question, sir? Yeah, I just want to understand, can you do a single stage to orbit, or do you need a, a second or third stage to get up? Yeah, you do need, you say single stage, you mean the gun, the single, the gun, the gun only? gun itself to orbit. No, because when you do the math, it turns out the, the gun would keep re-entering the atmosphere. Even if I launched it, say, 11 kilometers per second, either I would, you know, 11 plus, I would escape. If I launched it 10 kilometers, I would come back and hit the Earth, smack the Earth on the far side. So you ha once you get to apog in apogee, you want the simplest thing is just to turn a rocket motor on and circularize the orbit at that point. So you always need at least one stage, one extra rocket stage. So does a scramjet at high altitudes but not in space help you or not? No, I, I love scramjets and I worked on them. And we had the world record for high Mach flight, okay, not Mach 9. But they're extraordinarily impractical, extraordinarily impractical. Yeah. They're, but they, you know, they, they served a purpose for me because they enabled us to do lots of, not, lots of fun shots. God bless them. Um, with regards to the, um, the frequency of launches and the, um, the inefficiency of like payload to propellant used in the gun, what would you expect the average uh, launch to be, like a, a probe, um, like what kind of contents would you be expecting oh, to be launching well, on my, a frequent my basis? Yeah, my goal is to launch propellant. I want something very, very benign but extremely useful because 95% of your payload you needed low orbit is propellant. So essentially, right. I just want 95% of the market, and the other 5% yeah. can be people and electronics. TV dinners and electronics and stuff. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Let's 
So um, once you, you have launched your propellant into orbit, how would you collect the propellant in orbit? Because the orbital mechanics is um, not true. You, you cannot launch the propellant into one orbit if you operate the gun like, I don't know, 100 times a day or 10 times a day. So how, how do you approach this problem? Yeah, basically, you need multiple. If you want to launch multiple times per day, say more than a couple of times per day, say you're at the equator, which is the best of all situations. You know, so you have a, you have a, a, a station coming overhead every 90 minutes, so you'd launch every every hour and a half. Okay, so you could do 16 launches per day if you had a single one. If you had more than one, then obviously you can do as many as 24 or more launches per day. So the answer is you need more than one gas station. Just, just a quick question. Um, in terms of uh, the, the second stage and, and the gun itself, um, as you already have sort of a, a plan for using the, I think it's the 14-inch um, diameter uh, yes. tubing, then that, that kind of puts a cap on this. But what's the max uh, payload mass you can launch with this, if it's yeah. fuel? Yeah, uh, back in the day, I, we did an article. It was in Popular Science, February uh, 010. Popular Science, you can look it up. It had a really nice picture of an of a, of a ocean-based system, and it was a 1,000-pound payload. So a thousand pound, and I think that was a two meter diameter barrel. The Japanese can make two meter diameter barrels till the cows come home. We have to go to the Japanese to do that, though. Okay, so the question yeah. is very much. Uh, Dr. Hart, um, Jim Clark uh, was suggesting as we were watching your talk. Um, what about if we considered kind of your propulsion, and uh, perhaps how we might use that to um, launch people into space and. We were, we were kind of wondering if we enclosed the body in water, if we somehow vacuum sealed the body in a water system, could we in fact overcome the issue of the G-forces? And if that was still problematic, could we look at, say, a hydrogen, I mean, an oxygen-rich you know, liquid system to fill the body? You know, I think it's worth a try, actually, with certain attorneys I have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have two I need to call right now, in fact. Uh, no, 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 as you know, as a practical matter, the problem is the density in your body changes dramatically. D bone's density two and a half and the tissue's density one. So, so the problem is even if you're hydrostatically enclosed, the things inside your body have issues. So you, you'll never launch people. But, you, you, but like I said, there are attorneys and other forms of life that you can launch. Am I just uh, uh, reading that you volunteered to try, Sarah? <laughs> That's okay. Please forgive me. Um, uh, is, is there one last question? Yeah, oh, okay. There's just one, one down here, and then we'll uh, so uh, call it a day. Have you looked at using it in space, so a, a gas gun in space? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, back in 90, like 92 or so, or 94, I gave a talk at Livermore in the physics department there on a, on a, a lunar gun. Jordan Kerr, who's a laser propulsion guy, some of you guys may know Jordan. Anyway, Jordan Kerr and I teamed up. We put a little talk together using room temperature hydrogen, which is, you don't even heat it up on the moon, because lunar escape is like 2.4 clicks per second, something like that. Turns out that's, that's, right, that's so vanilla for hydrogen, you don't even heat this stuff up. So we, we, we designed a lunar, moon, lunar gun that would launch stuff into lunar orbit time and again, and uh, it looked like a total winner. See, there's been a big rush towards electric guns because people are fascinated by electricity to this day. It's really funny. But if you look at all the world records, they're held by hydrogen gas guns. And since I was not, a, I was a particle theorist at one time, I don't care. I have no parochial interest in, in embezzling electrons, okay? I don't really care about electrons. And I just want to get the job done, you know. So, uh, for example, my dad built houses, so my summers I would spend digging sewers. So I'm a practical guy, okay? So I don't care about what your degree was in or, or whether you have funding from the agency or this or that. The real answer is just use hydrogen. It's a light gas. It works like a charm. The data is already there. Okay, thank you so much for an extremely stimulating talk. Uh, and um, uh, I'd like to in uh, invite the next speaker, Dr. Rob Adams, to the stage now. He's going to be talking about building, repairing, and upgrading vehicles in space. Dr. Adams, do you have a mobile phone on you? I do not. <laughs> I learned my lesson. So thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, a lot of you guys know me from my other job, and several other people who work at the same place I do are here on their own nickel. So uh, uh, I'm actually not here representing NASA, just like uh, the other guys. I'm here representing myself. I also have a, uh, a lab 
uh, that I've started in Huntsville. It's a fab lab. And I'm not going to go too much detail on that. You can ask me about that later. But uh, it's, a, it's a rapid prototyping lab that we have uh, uh, available to the public. So um, I've also worked with the Icarus team uh, almost since inception. And I was not going to miss this, this. This is, you know, so cool. So I wanted to come up with something that wasn't NASA related, but still, you know, I've got a lot of space background, but also something that was uh, of interest uh, at the Fab Lab, which is, you know, rapid prototyping and inventing and whatnot. And so when I thought, looked at the confluence of the two, I was like, hey, fabrication in space. I'm sorry, my <laughs> fonts have kind of blown up here. But uh, um, so what I did is uh, just kind of a, re a review of what's going on in terms of uh, uh, doing fab work in space. So this is kind of a literature review. Uh, I've got a couple of my own insights, but you know it's mainly other people's work. Uh, so there's a lot uh, going on in terms of 3D printing in space, and so I'm going to talk about the different 3D technologies. Uh, but 3D printing has been proposed to uh, solve a lot of problems in spaceflight. Uh, uh, creating complex parts here on the ground uh, to speed up the development process of new launch vehicles and spacecraft. Uh, reducing spare parts for long duration missions so that we don't have to carry as many spares. Uh, actually building spacecraft in space uh, from scratch, and there's a lot of advantages there. There's a, a number of research in extraterrestrial bases, and uh, I see the font blew up here. Uh, supporting astronauts uh, as well. So I'm going to talk about each one of these topics uh, one at a time and go into a little detail. Okay, so the first one is, uh, uh, here's a picture here of, uh, of Administrator Bolden visiting Marshall. And so uh, there's been a lot of talk around uh, uh, Space Flight Center about the new method for us to create injector manifolds. And so if you've ever had to work on an injector manifold design, it take, that one part takes a year or more of development. Uh, you think about what an injector has to do, spray uh, you know, hot hydrogen and hot oxygen uh, for eight to 10 minutes, uh, complete combustion, and then you know, uh, survive in 4,000 degree temperatures, so on and so forth. It's a very intricate uh, part that has a lot of cooling channels, has a lot of, of uh, pathways to actually uh, atomize the propellants and get them to mix well, so on and so forth. So uh, 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 also complicating this is the fact that it has to be welded together, and so those welds end up being weak points. So now uh, the system is being made in uh, weeks to a month instead of a year because we're using 3D printing systems. And so the specific system that's being used, um, and these are new injector manifolds for both the first and the second stage engines, Got some reverb over there. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, this is CNN. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, my fonts really got blown up here. So, uh, the um, the uh, uh, the method that used here. There's a lot of different 3D printing methods, and I'm going to talk about most of them uh, very briefly. Uh, there's a number of what are called granular systems. And so if you look at this diagram right here, what happens is there is a test print area right here and a roller plate that rolls some sort of granule, granules over the part. And then some sort of heating system comes through and melts selectively parts of those granules. And so uh, that actually builds up the part one layer at a time. And so the methods that you have our uh, SLS, the Selective Laser Sintering uh, System, this, so this would be a laser actually sintering. Uh, uh, it could be plastic, it could be uh, metal, uh, titanium, uh, so on and so forth. And so SLS was the actual system used to create the injector manifolds. Now you can also do the same thing, make titanium parts specifically with uh, an electron beam as opposed to a laser. Or uh, one of my favorites is the selective heat sister, uh, centering. So you'd actually have some sort of a, just a thermal heat device right here. And so my uh, favorite thing is where they use this and they uh, put little sugar granules in here and make candy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so granular systems are one category of the 3D printers that are out there. Now uh, Marshall is also working on, with a company called Made in Space and they have developed their own little desktop uh, 3D printer that will go to the space station in 2014. So this is an experimental uh, 
uh, system right here, and you know it's kind of neat. It looks like the 3D printers that you may have seen at uh, Staples or you know online. I have one in my lab. Um, now this system uses what's called fused deposition modeling, and that is probably the 3D printer option that most people are most familiar with. And so if we go to this diagram right here, I can actually show what that looks like. Uh, if you've seen it, you've seen a big spool of plastic, you know, a little wire plastic that may be 1.75 or 3 millimeters are the standard sizes, and they drive through some sort of drive wheel, and let me tell you, this thing jams <laughs> all the frickin' time. Uh, I have five major machines in my lab. All the other ones, uh, I've had to have send one back. This one I take apart once a week. And this is the good one. The one I had before this, I used to take apart once a day. So, uh, um, so in case, so this uh, drive system right here pulls the filament down, shoves it through a heating device right here, and then you have a you know sub millimeter hole down here at the tip, and that thing is just going around on the test bed and laying down uh, plastic. And so again, you're printing up a uh, uh, a piece you know, about two-tenths of a millimeter at a time. So a little piece that might be, say, you know, I hate to change units on you guys, but I think in English. So something that might be two inches tall will have three, four hundred layers to it. Um, so like I said, this is probably the most popular uh, method. And the reason for this is that uh, the patents on the fused deposition method ran out about five or six years ago. So we saw this explosion of different uh, uh, fused deposition method printers that have hit the market, they've driven the price way, way down. Um, like I'm pointing out, the quality could be better. <laughs> but I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, you know, uh, the cycle of technology development. The patents run out. We instead of having one expensive, unreliable devices, we have hundreds of cheap, unreliable devices. <laughs> <laughs> And eventually we'll have a few, you know, the, the market will shake out and we'll have a few uh, devices that are uh, uh, hopefully more reliable. Okay, so, uh, you know, we can use this system. Obviously this system, oh, the, uh, this system right here is, is going to be used to test, uh, you know, just printing simple parts for, uh, for the astronauts to use. It's definitely experiment. It's not part of the... Uh, built-in reliability of the uh, space station, obviously, but uh, you know they'll have uh, breakdowns and they'll be able to make things. Uh, I've done this. Everyone who gets a 3D printer has to go print themselves a wrench. I mean, it's just a requirement. <laughs> I, I think it's coded in law. So you know they can go print themselves a little wrench with the little you know the adjustable wrench with the little dial and whatnot, and it all comes out in one piece. And you're going, wow, this is cool. Even though you spent you know, 12 hours printing something you could have run down the hardware store and bought for three bucks. But, uh, um, but hey, they don't have a hardware store in the station, so, you know, this is a good thing for them. So, uh, one Johnson said, weight uh, uh, that comes with that. So uh, calculating the weight savings can be difficult, but you can imagine that there's 95% of your spare parts inventory that you can save in your, uh, in your uh, project. Um, so you know, the way you would attack this is generally you'd have to identify which uh, spares are most uh, needed, and then uh, you, know, you can have some of those in stock, and then you can have the 3D printer to cover all of your other issues. Um, now, the only thing you have to worry about now is what happens if the 3D printer fails. Now you've uh, got no way to replace all those spares. So that is an issue. Um, you can have multiple 3D printers, and you know, like I'm saying, I, I wouldn't make them fuse deposition methods uh, because they're so unreliable. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting research going on in the third category where 3D printers really. Uh, uh, add to the system, and that is uh, actually building uh, structures in space. And so there is a 2012 
NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts Phase 1 project, and that's by Tethers Unlimited, and they call it Spider Fab. And so you can imagine building these huge uh, array of antennas or uh, radio telescopes or even solar sails, and we've talk, heard a lot about that today, um, using these structures right here. And so here's a material source spool by uh, their little spinneret here, and then as it's reeled out into space, it hardens, and then you've got two little uh, manipulators there that actually, you know, link everything up. And then there's another crawler that crawls around and lays the panels down as well. So you can imagine, you know, hey, that's great, you can build very big structures, but there's another really important part to this that uh, makes this advantageous. And that is that if I had to design that system for launch, you know, my uh, launch vehicle, you know, imposes three to five Gs. Now, of course, the last speaker imposes 3,000 to 5,000 Gs, so that's, that's a whole other thing. But uh, here we're imposing three to five Gs on our, our uh, launch vehicle, and so any structure that I put in there has to be able to withstand those Gs. So that's a lot of extra structural mass. Plus I have a, a G of lateral uh, loads as well. If I go in space, um, even if I use a chemical system, uh, as opposed to an ion drive or solar cell or something like that, even if I use a chemical system, I'm generally not going to impose more than uh, a tenth of that onto my, uh, my structures, and I'm not going to have any lateral loads because I'm not flying through the atmosphere. So I have uh, an order of magnitude less loads, and so what happens is that now the structural weight of my uh, vehicle is less a function of being able to handle uh, the, the actual stresses, but more about what required stiffness I need. And so I can save a considerable amount of the structural weight of my uh, vehicle. Uh, another really cool thing is uh, uh, using 3D printer technology to actually print extraterrestrial bases. And there's a lot of uh, uh, interest here. Now, uh, I'm really going to mangle this gentleman's name, but uh, Amit Bandiopathe um, is a researcher at Washington State. And so he has actually uh, received lunar simulant from JSC and, and put it through an adapted Optimec uh, 3D printer and printed, you know, small structures like this, uh, you know, to show the viability of just taking lunar regolith, putting it in a hopper, heating it up, and squirting it into some sort of structure. Similarly, ESA uh, is partnered with a company called Foster and Partners, and they're looking at, you know, here's some artist renditions of a lunar base where they're actually printing the domes and then shoving regolith over the dome to uh, provide more radiation and micrometeorite shielding. And so they did an experimental test where they built this honeycomb lattice right here. Uh, they didn't have that much lunar simulant, that's a lot, but they went and got uh, about um, 15 tons, uh, metric tons, I believe, of, uh, of local vo volcanic ash and put it in their simulant. And then they put their heater in there and uh, just printed up this uh, 1.5 ton structure. You notice it's a honeycomb lattice, so it's you know a good combination of stiffness and strength uh, while being lightweight. And they uh, solve some interesting problems. Uh, the biggest of it, which is if I start melting lunar regolith in a vacuum environment, how much of that is going to sublime, you know, actually evaporate into gas and start plating all over my, my systems? And what they found is that they could actually inject the nozzle underneath the bed of the regolith and trap all of the gases or most of the gases at least, and be able to build the, the, the uh, structure underground, if you will. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, similarly, there's a 2003 NIAC Phase one that was recently uh, awarded uh, from uh, University of South Carolina, uh, South Carolina, excuse me, uh, uh, football season's almost here, uh, University of uh, Southern California. Uh, and uh, hey, I'm from Alabama, <laughs> come on. Uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, he uh, uses a method called contour uh, crafting, and so here he has a hopper, and he's just printing the side walls here of a uh, future lunar base himself. And so, uh, you know, it'll be very interesting to see what the results of uh, this research is. Uh, another thing that's going on, this is a phase uh, one small business innovative uh, research grant uh, awarded out of Johnson to system materials and research uh, consultancy, and the idea here is that now we're going to use 3D printers to print food. So we're past the pill stage, we're just going to use machines to make our food for us. Um, you can see some of the things they've printed over here. 
I'm glad they didn't serve lunch today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, on, on a happier note, I have seen, and I'm, I'm ready to do this at my lab, to take a, a RepRap 3D printer, which is what they use in their system, and print chocolates. I mean, I've seen it done a couple times, and I'm ready to do that project one of these weekends. Um, the idea here is that uh, you can save a lot in mass by having all of your foods in large containers, which are then used to inject to be, you know, formed up into a... Um, you know, whatever form, you know, is going, you're going to find most appetizing. Their target right now is to make a pizza. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Now, you know, the, if, if you go through their research, uh, it, it, it's very strong in that they can talk about tailoring uh, caloric and vitamin profiles for individual astronauts, being able to uh, uh, keep a much longer shelf life in these larger storage containers than individually wrapped uh, uh, food items. I can tell you that before I was at NASA, I worked uh, for McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing, on the Space Hab program, and my personal experience is that packaging these consumables, putting them in foam and putting them in lockers, easily doubled the amount of mass that was necessary to carry this food and water up in the first place. So if I put these things in big containers, I get to eliminate all of that mass. Um, there's a reason why the progress module uh, is filled with junk after every ISS mission. It's just foam and wrappers and, you know, like a big picnic gone awry, all in that, uh, that one container, and that's why it gets burnt up in the uh, uh, atmosphere on the way back. So, you know, substantial uh, mass savings here. Now, uh, we can think about a long-term mission with humans on it and the need for being able to take care of the human's health. There's a lot of diagnostic applications for uh, 3D printing. Um, last year, I was unfortunate enough to crush my uh, right elbow. It still has, uh, it's not going to ever straighten up again, unfortunately. But uh, um, at one point, the doctor was trying to explain to me how, you know, my elbow had crushed in. And I got the idea that I was going to 3D print my elbow from the CAT scans. And I told him about that, and he said, oh, yeah, we can order that for you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, well. And I didn't want to pay the god-awful amount that, uh, you know, I would have had to pay there. But, uh, you know, I was all excited to take his stuff and, you know, lay it up on my machine and whatnot. So, so diagnostic applications like that. Um, there are printed bladders. Uh, bladders only require two different differentiated uh, uh, cell types, so they're easy to print. Uh, little uh, children who've, you know, uh, been uh, born with deformed ears or a collapsed trachea, you know, as the as those regrow back, they, uh, you know, use have used uh, 3D printed items to help them along the way. Um, I, I got another idea about uh, one of my colleagues was pregnant and she was going to have her baby, and I, and she came to me, and I can't remember which one of us had the idea, but we were going to print a picture of the fetus from the picture and whatnot. Turns out that people are doing that now, too. So I just need to have my ideas faster, apparently. Um, uh, there's also something, uh, uh, this was from Australia, so I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, today, I'll make 75% of his skull replaced with a uh, 3D printed object. And then here is research. Uh, Wake Forest is a great place to go look. They're doing a lot of interesting things here where they use a form and they're trying to 3D print using uh, stem cells and whatnot, kidneys and other uh, uh, biologic uh, organs. So you can imagine the usefulness of this on a long duration space flight. Now there's also been some interesting research about the hazards of these 3D printers and one of the things that uh, uh, we have to be concerned about is uh, uh, acetobutyl ni uh, uh, styrene, which is uh, ABS, which is the same sort of plastic Legos is made out of, is uh, the main filament that you'll see used in these forced deposition uh, printers that are so popular right now. Uh, they do produce, you know, a small amount of carbon monoxide and uh, hydrogen cyanide. And so another thing that they do is they off-gas uh, uh, fine particulates, which can you know, in inhibit uh, lung operation. And so there's an experiment where they just kept printing these little cute frogs in a 45 uh, cubic meter room and measured how much uh, particulate by uh, size that they were seeing. And you can see 
you know, they had uh, five printers going off in this 45 cubic meter room, which is, you know, a decent sized room, but uh, um, what, it's probably a quarter of our hall right here. Um, and they saw a pretty good spike in particulate matter. Fortunately, my lab is bigger, so <laughs> I'm not as worried. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something to be uh, not terribly alarming, but something that would be of higher concern in a confined spacecraft. Five minutes, got it. All right, so there are a couple other uh, uh, 3D printing uh, methodologies that I think would be worth looking at down the road for space applications. This one's called laminated object manufacturing. And here, you actually have a roller, and sometimes this is paper, sometimes this is aluminum, sometimes this is, uh, you know, other uh, materials where you would lay one layer after another using the roller system or, you know, a belt-driven system, and then you'd have your uh, laser or other cutting uh, system to actually go cut out the profile for that layer. And these layers are, are kind of glued or uh, melted together. And then you hash everything that you don't want, and you keep doing this, and by the time you get to the end, you have this block of paper or aluminum or whatever, but all the things you don't want is ha are hashed, and they just break apart. Now, if you, can, if you can recycle the hashed parts, which should be re relatively easy to do with aluminum, uh, the nice thing about this is that this builds larger parts than most of the other 3D printers. The other 3D printers, you tend to see bed sizes on the order of a cubic foot or smaller. So here you could start building larger parts uh, that could be used in space applications. Uh, stereolithography is very important. Uh, you see a lot of this in the next level up uh, printers, especially the resin printers. And so here you have a vat of liquid and it is being hardened either through a uh, laser or a Doppler process. Uh, and so it's selectively being lasered layer by layer to build up the part. The nice thing about this, as opposed to fused deposition and whatnot, is that the part is suspended inside the liquid, and the liquid provides a uh, right. support mechanism uh, that you don't get with fused deposition. That's probably the biggest reliability issue with fused deposition, is that sometimes you want to print like a, a figure, and so if I'm printing a figure and my arm's out like this, what's supporting the arm? You know, you can't just send the head over there and start printing the arm. You have to build up all this uh, support, and unfortunately the... Um, the uh, algorithms to print that support so that it will snap away when you want to get rid of it and yet still support the arm. Well, they need a lot of work. Okay, there's a lot of well-known 3D printers. Um, the RepRap is really cool. I mean, the whole uh, intent is to make it a Von Neumann machine uh, to have a RepRap that could print a RepRap. At this point, you know, there are markets and people all over the world that are printing parts for a rep wrap and then selling or giving them to other people who are making rep wraps. Uh, still the, you know, the motors, the controllers, and the steel structures, you know, they have to be, you know, not printed, but they're uh, part of the system. Uh, the MakerBot, you know, Make Magazine is a big player in this market, and so they have their MakerBot replicator. It's actually a, a pretty popular system. I've not heard great things about their reliability, but hey, uh, you know, I haven't played with it myself. Um, and then I had to show the Candy Fab. This was that selective uh, uh, heat centering system. And the only reason I put this on here is they have the coolest slogan, the revolution will be caramelized. <laughs> <laughs> so I just love that one. Um, here is a real quick and dirty estimate. Uh, again, my fonts blew up here. Um, spares, food, water, structures, those were the four major areas where I saw the potential for mass savings. Uh, an asteroid mission, uh, 60 days, four crew. Here are some, you know, reasonable numbers from a, a recent study uh, on what those would be. Uh, with 3D printing, I assumed, you know, what sort of uh, masses I would need. Uh, here I assumed that I could save 75% of my mass on spares. 50% uh, on food and water, 25 from structures. Um, don't ask me where those percentages came from. Uh, they're out of the air. So um, having said that, so I, you know, used these averages. They, they seemed reasonable to me at the time. Uh, calculated some, some new weights. Uh, you know, I'm saving maybe five metric tons on the asteroid and maybe 15 on the 3D printing system. Uh, so that could translate directly into uh, uh, more payload mass. Or I went ahead and, you know, kind of did the uh, 
delta v equations and whatnot, just to see uh, you know how much smaller the vehicles would get. It worked out to about seven and twenty metric tons. So, um, final thoughts. Near terms, you know, those mass savings are not insignificant, especially if you're trying to fit on to uh, an Ares 5 or, or a SLS, I should say, um, or, you know, a Delta IV or something like that. Uh, far term, I see uh, less a worry about mass savings, but more about the reliability of the system, having something to, that can repair and, and fix the, the uh, spacecraft, whether that be a robotic or a, or a crewed vehicle. And so, especially when we're talking about multi-year missions or multi-decade missions, you know, that's a very important issue. And then also if we get to where we can uh, acquire more of our materials in space as opposed to on the ground, then definitely we're going to want methods like this to actually build the spacecraft and that's going to make our, uh, our uh, ability to do these missions much more cost effective. Um, the big thing, you know, I talked about how the fuse deposition patents ran out f five or six years ago, we saw an explosion the selective laser centering patents run out next year. So get ready. Because my hope is, is that we'll start seeing, you know, more progress towards our Von Neumann machines, and then eventually we'll get to... <laughs> so. Thank you so much for that hugely enjoyable and informative talk. Um, are there a few questions? Oh, um, Richard's got one there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rob. Um, I want to put this in the context um, of interstellar flight, uh, specifically okay. multi-stage starships, for example, being Daedalus, which was a two-stage fusion rocket. I and think those, that's an excellent idea for this conference. And those, thank you. <laughs> those early stages, uh, other than providing a platform for that initial delta V, that's essentially mass that's been accelerated and then won't be used for the, you know, for the final mission ultimately. Right. Um, could you ever see this type of technology over the next 50, 100 years even evolving to the point getting so sophisticated where you could perhaps cannibalize those early stages to be used for, for example, the payload or some other useful feature for the final mission? You know, I'm never in the business of predicting 50 years down the future. That seems pretty reasonable to me. I mean, you know, there are already methods right now about being able to recycle existing plastic methods. So, you know, it's just a matter of heat and power as far as I'm concerned. Sadly, we're really out of time, so uh, if you've got more questions for Dr. Adams, I'm sure he'd like to use his entire 10 minutes break uh, to answer them. So uh, we have a 10 minute break now, uh, probably apart from Dr. Adams, um, and then I'd like to see you back here at uh, 3 o'clock and we'll start the next session. And could the next three speakers just come and quickly see us, please, just to make sure you're here. and. Uh,